Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. Brush up on your summoning charms and figure out how to transfigure a rock into a dog, because this week we're hightailing it out of the dragon's den on our firebolt when we discuss <laughs> chapter 20, the first task. And to help us jump back into chapter by chapter this week, we are joined by one of our Slug Club patrons, Catherine. Welcome, Catherine, to MuggleCast. Hi, thanks for having me. I've been looking looking forward to my day, to my chance to host a podcast with you guys. I'm really excited, and it's a great honor and pleasure to be here with you all. Welcome, it's welcome. our pleasure to have you here. We're yeah. excited to have you. Yeah, and you and Laura bonded over being in uh, Georgia, living in the we same did. state, so that was fun. Yeah. Yeah, we're already besties here, as if we weren't already all good Harry Potter friends. Besties from the resties. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're a teacher, right? I am. I teach uh, psychology at a college here in town. And uh, yeah, so it's a lot of fun. So definitely rereading the Harry Potter books from a more psychological perspective has been interesting for sure, especially this chapter. Ooh. Cool. And let's get your fandom ID. All right. So my favorite book is Prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, My favorite movie is also Prisoner of Azkaban, but I also like Order of the Phoenix um, because as much as I just I love to hate Umbridge. So I like to watch it and like make myself suffer. But I mean, give it up. Imelda Staunton. I mean, come on. Chef's kiss. So yeah, uh, (laughs) for sure. Um, She makes that movie. Um, My Hogwarts house is Ravenclaw. um, But I also sprinkle a little bit of Gryffindor in there. so, because I usually when I take the test, it's either Ravenclaw or Gryffindor. So, you know, kind of get to give it up to my what Ravendors or yeah, uh, Griffin Claws. Um, my Ilvermorny house is Thunderbird. Uh, my Patronus is Ardvark and Ardvark, which Ooh. I've never really heard many people have that one. So it was shout out Arthur stands. Yeah, I was gonna do the like A A R D V A R K, you know, the rap from Arthur, but you know, <laughs> thank you, thank you, you understand. And then my favorite character, it's definitely a tough choice because there's lots of great ones, but I gotta go with my gal Luna, you know. Okay, it's great to have you here, Catherine, and thanks so much for your support on Patreon. We really appreciate your support there. Thank you so much, absolutely. So before we get into the chapter, a little bit of news, we can call it a news update, I guess. Eric, do you want to uh, tell us? The latest comments from an actor? Yes. So (laughs) this is our actor roundup for the week. Um, Because in a recent uh, article published on Bustle, um, Helena Bonham Carter was asked uh, her thoughts on the Miriam Margulies situation. So, of course, we have commented, uh, it came up on the last two MogoCast episodes, that Miriam Margulies recently had some words to say about adult Harry Potter fans. And I guess Bustle took an opportunity to speak with Helen Bonham Carter about her role as Bellatrix in the movies and also her thoughts on what Miriam had to say. And quote from the article from Helena Bonham Carter is, I love that woman and she's somebody who has a big inner child. I think however old we are, we've got to keep that child alive. And so that to me speaks to like a very calming down of the let's let's not fan the flame let's be like it's good to have an inner child and she's speaking to us too right like yeah yeah like still have that yeah Yeah. i think there was an implication that we needed to either grow up or that harry potter was for children i think in Mm -hmm. in miriam's original sort of quote so i actually found this news to be really satisfying and it might help uh, dull tensions a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. So do we feel like any time in the next couple of weeks, maybe month or two months, any time a Harry Potter actor is interviewed, they're going to mm. get asked a question about Miriam Margulies? It's probably. So, probably. That's a good call out, Micah. And also, I think even Miriam Margulies realized that it was kind of like biting the hand a little bit. Like she led in her comments by saying, I'm very grateful to Harry Potter for everything it's given me. So this is one of those things where I think the media is having a heyday and they're sensationalizing, you know, comments. And that's why we get this update of other actors being asked to comment on what Miriam Margulies has said. Well, thank you, Helena, for standing with us. Yeah. And interestingly, that article does talk about uh, the character of Bellatrix, actually. And uh, it was interesting to see that Helena sort of admits that 
the character of Bellatrix that she played is different than what appears in the books. And she talks about how the Bellatrix character in the movies is a little bit more childish. Um, And I know we definitely got kind of that like babying, neener, neener, neener kind of personality that really is not a faithful adaptation of the character in the books who's just insane. But I think it works. I still maintain that Helena Bonham Carter made Bellatrix's character better. Because when we were rereading Order of the Phoenix and reading her character, I was like, oh, my God, this character does not jump off the page in the same way that Helena Bonham Carter jumped off the screen. Not at all. She totally improved Bellatrix. I killed Sirius Black. That was a great line. That (laughs) one always sticks with me. It really gets under your skin. You could probably argue got her more screen time in future films than maybe she otherwise Mm -hmm. would have gotten. I'm thinking about... The Burrow scene in particular, which was not in the books, but That's was right. added. And but they needed to make it darker, right? That's what they said at the of time. Of course. Yeah. Well, especially as we progress throughout the course of the Harry Potter films, everything was darker. Everything had to be darker. Oh, so darker. I could barely see. It's getting darker. This is the darkest one yet. The the thing I will say for Professor Sprout and Miriam Margulies is just they didn't have a whole lot of screen time in this series overall. And maybe that contributed a little bit to how she feels versus somebody like Helena Bottom Carter, who got a fair amount as the series went on. And of course, she has a fantastic relationship with Daniel Radcliffe, which we saw come to life in the reunion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll uh, see who comments on this next. My money is on one of the trio, <laughs> probably. <laughs> and I'm sure they'll have a nice, uh, uh, cordial answer that wins over fans. So now it's time to get into chapter by chapter. And this week we are discussing Goblet of Fire chapter 20, the first task. It's time for this tournament. And we'll start as always with our seven word summary. Here we go. Dragons are afoot inside Hogwarts Grounds. Ah! <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I don't know how to end that otherwise. <laughs> what happened to Laura? <laughs> yeah, where's her? I, I don't know. Oh my God. <laughs> I forgot. Wait, did I not do that right with five? I, I just put our names. Laura, feel okay. Laura, if you could change one word. Okay, no. What would change it? Yeah. Oh, oh that's fine. Change, Laura, change yeah. I thought I was getting a break because I did Girls Muggle Cat last oh, week. Oh my god, that wasn't that's my intention true. at all. Trust me, I am aware. I was, I was happy to sit back and watch y'all <laughs> work the seven word summary. I have been stressing about this all day. <laughs> like, what was oh, going to happen? Oh my god. No, you did. You did. You did a great job. <sighs> Honestly, I've. I think we we take the risky click and we leave it as is. Wow. Okay. And okay. We we see if this is one of the ones we end up correcting. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes funny ones like this really resonate with people. So Laura gets to do all seven words next week. So stay tuned, everybody, <laughs> to make up for this. Well, that's not as fun. <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so getting into the chapter, of course, that Andrew mentioned this is we finally get. Uh, face to face with a dragon. The tournament is finally begun. I'm I'm hearing the battle music uh, playing. God, it only and, took twenty chapters. I know, well, <laughs> there was some stuff to introduce first, but but yeah. So I've kind of broken the chapter into two general components, and of course, Harry is still sort of struggling with what is ahead of him. Uh, Throughout this chapter, it's bearing down upon him, especially now that he knows that it's dragons that he has to face. Uh, So there's definitely uh, a lot of anxiety going high. And, you know, it it definitely is really interesting. It's this character or this chapter is essentially like a good character study on on Harry, I think, who for being the main character, we don't always check in on or we don't see him be as versatile or react to, like so differently to different stimuli as we do in this chapter. It's really a great study for Harry. It's kind of funny, I think, that we are so inside Harry's head. You know, we're seeing it from his perspective. But like you said, we don't check in with what's his emotions going What are his emotions going on right now? What's, you know, what are his intentions behind what he does? What is his motivation behind what he does? 
Yeah. We don't, we don't check in with that. I fully agree. Yeah. I mean, this whole chapter, he's basically going from like, oh, Hermione can't help me. I'm not getting what I need to navigating, telling Cedric and trying to be fair. You know, everything that, that really happens is all Harry is, is leading it and we're, we're following, but it's, it's just way different from, from scene to scene. So, you know, the, the big thing that I did want to call out is Harry does find a really clever way to tell Cedric. Um, he unfortunately splits his uh, brand new backpack uh, or satchel, uh, which hopefully can be repaired. But this is the moment where Harry really could have taken what he knew, what he knows to be an advantage just to him. And we see that Harry is very much not that way at all. He finds the way to tell Cedric, hey, Cedric, it's dragons. And I just wanted to ask, like, what does that say about Harry's character that he does this? It's one of my favorite types of moments from Harry, just to see him come to the aid of Mm -hmm. a fellow student. And then once you read back on this, the fact that these were unfortunately Cedric's final months and giving him an assist. (laughs) Well, no, really. I mean, it's like somebody somebody (laughs) tried and the Hogwarts students have to stick together. And Harry could have thought, oh, you know what? I'm going to get the advantage over the other Hogwarts student by not telling him. But he decided because uh, Crumb knows, because Fleur knows, I'm going to make sure, because I know, I'm going to make sure Cedric knows. So it's fair for everybody. And I just, it's a very heartwarming moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's determined. He's hes stalking Cedric through the halls to ensure that he can get some alone time with him. And part of it is, I think Harry is longing for some kind of positive connection to anyone that isn't Hermione. For as much as Hermione has been a great help to him over the course of these last couple of chapters, we see it in this chapter with the summoning charm. He is really in need of that connection that he normally has with Ron. And I think by telling Cedric about the task, it validates him, at least in his own mind, as not being the bad guy who snuck into the tournament. I think he's put in this position where he has to almost clear his own name. And by doing something like this, I think it puts him on better footing with Cedric moving forward. That's such a great yeah, analysis of Harry needing mm-hmm. a friend. And I think he, even if he gets Ron back, which he does at the end of this chapter, everything's fine now between them, but he needs a friend in this tournament. He needs to have some level of human connection with another one of the champions at minimum. You know, hopefully all four of them would have a level of respect that I think they do get to as they know each other better. But nobody knows him. These older students don't really know him and they don't know his character. And so this is really the catalyst for first Cedric kind of, you know, realizing Cedric even asks Harry, why are you telling me this? And Harry's so taken aback by the question. He's like, but it's it's fair. He doesn't even, that's the coolest the right thing, thing about Harry do. is he does the right thing and it's not difficult for him to do the right thing. This is just what Harry always would have done. It also says to Cedric, I didn't put my name in the cup because why would I put my name in the cup and want to win and then give information to you that could help you win? So maybe one reason why Harry wanted to tell Cedric was so that Cedric could maybe put the good word in if uh, Cedric is seeing Harry get bullied out and about around school. Hey, you know what, guys? Mm-hmm. I really don't think he did put his name in the goblet. I think he's telling the truth. Yeah. We know that Cedric eventually tells the other like students, like his fellow Hufflepuffs, does not wear the Potter Stinks badges anymore once it mm-hmm. becomes clear to... And I think after the first task alone, when they're up again, they, you know, the whole school sees all of them up against dragons. I think more students than will ever say it out loud realize that Harry, yeah, it's they come to the same realization Ron does, that it would be wildly absurd to think that Harry really chose this for himself. So both Harry's actions interpersonally and in general, I think, work to clear his name because he's just a good guy. Absolutely. I mean, that was my point. At the end of the day, Harry has a good heart. You know, we don't talk about that a lot, but he does. He has a good heart. I don't see him not sharing that information with Cedric. Like he knew Cedric didn't have an informant. I mean, you know, Hagrid was Harry's informant. The other headmasters clearly it's in some capacity were the, were the informants to their champions. Cedric doesn't have anybody. And like we said, he knew it wouldn't be a fair fight. You're sending three people in who have this prior knowledge and that's not fair. 
And that's also not a true Gryffindor either. You know, a true Gryffindor is, is, is you have that bravery and isn't it brave to stand up and do the right thing? Harry's showing his true Gryffindor. Yeah, he's showing his true Gryffindor characteristics I was gonna say, by sharing that information. Is it brave to kneecap yourself <laughs> and give yourself a I mean, disadvantage? Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. But I mean, I suppose we could argue that um, a Slytherin probably wouldn't do this, right? That yeah. it wouldn't be super characteristic, at least in the way that Slytherins are portrayed right. at this point in the wizarding world. Um, a Slytherin wouldn't do this. Maybe a Slytherin by 2024 standards would do it. But I I tend to agree with Catherine. I also think it just says that he doesn't want the unfair advantages or special treatment because people are always kind of trying to foist that upon him. And it makes him uncomfortable. He doesn't like it. He doesn't want the special attention. We see this theme throughout the series. Yeah, later in this chapter, Bagman offers again, too. Mm-hmm. And Harry's just like, no, no, thank you. So it's funny, Micah, because you mentioned um, Harry sort of stalking Cedric Diggory, trying to find him, get him alone and tell him the secret because somebody is also stalking Harry, uh, it would seem. <laughs> so Barty Crouch Jr., Oh, oh, sorry, Mad Eye Fakey uh, comes out of a an, a less used classroom or something right as Harry is telling Cedric, and he's like, "Potter, come with me." It's this classic moment of Harry thinks he's in trouble. He turns out not to be. However, it is funny because it really does seem like Barty Crouch is keeping a very close eye on Harry Potter, and the whole reason why he calls him to his office is to say that was a nice thing and kind of have you know, an additional experience with Harry. So do we find that to be suspicious activity on the part of Moody at this point? Or do we assume that because of Harry's predicament that it's only natural that somebody like Moody would be tailing Harry? The genius is in the uh, equal possibilities, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. especially... Yeah, in hindsight, it seems suspicious or it's like, oh, yeah, Moody is here at this scene because he's following Harry and looking for a chance to, I I think, again, win his favor a little bit, Um, you know, and and it's interesting. We'll talk in a minute about how he goes about doing that. But definitely, you know, in in the whole sort of stalking Harry, it just the way it's written as a kid when you're first reading it, you're like, Oh, uh oh, a teacher just happened to see him cheating. Like, and and the book says, is he gonna go to Dumbledore? Like, what's what's gonna happen? Am I gonna be expelled from Hogwarts? It almost asks, like, it's the classic, uh oh, a teacher just witnessed what I did, which might not be a hundred percent above board. So it gives you kind of that that like schoolroom drama that you otherwise wouldn't have. Do y'all think that Dumbledore knows that Fakie is kind of tailing Harry and has he endorsed this? knowing that something is amiss. Somebody entered Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire. There was a Death Eater procession at the Quidditch World Cup. There's been all kinds of weird stuff going on, and they have one of the best aurors of all time at Hogwarts. Do we think that Dumbledore put Moody up to keeping an eye on Harry? I wouldn't be surprised. I'm yeah. trying to remember the movie and something is sticking out in my mind where Dumbledore asks Moody to keep an eye on Harry. I think it's after Barty Crouch Sr. is murdered. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think you're right, Micah. And then, of course, the advantage uh, with Moody is that he can see through walls, it seems. like Because in, in this mm-hmm. scene, Moody's not like... Yeah, what a perv. He just doesn't happen to... <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about that, though. In in <laughs> in this scene, he's, he's not like standing out in the hall and happens to witness this. He just kind of pops out after seeing it so yeah there's many advantages i think to enlisting moody to keep an extra eye on harry uh keep an eye keep an eye on what's when he says keep an eye on keep him, a mad eye on harry really literally yeah, mad yeah. Eye on well harry. Get it, i jumped to it. dumbledore doesn't dumbledore ask snape keep an eye on draco uh or keep an eye on quirrell that's what it is uh he says to snape can you keep an eye on quirrell would you and I can easily see that same conversation. Like, nobody needs to tell Fakie to keep an eye on Harry. Believe me, he absolutely will. Um, but I can believe that Dumbledore thinks that he's solving the problem by asking Moody to take who he believes to be Alistair Moody, his old horror friend, to take a closer look. So I, I think it works on many levels, which again, 
for a book that was maybe rushed in printing, we've we've heard it be said before, uh, there's a lot of really good kind of mystery and things that work on multiple levels. There's a lot of depth here. I want to talk about all of these dark detectors that he keeps in his office and they're buzzing worse than a beehive during mating season, but it's not drawing attention to anybody. And in particular, though, I wanted to talk about the faux glass because Snape being revealed as his true enemy later on in this book really should have been a major clue to his allegiance. And we'll get there when we get to that chapter, but Moody is doing an introduction to all of these different detectors that are in his office and they're all going off. Right. The yeah. sneakoscope is going. Mm-hmm. He said he had to deactivate it. Right. And if we remember from Prisoner of Azkaban, we all know what the sneakoscope does. Uh, and there was another thing, like a little radio that was doing weird things. I forget mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. Yeah. actual name of it, but he's blaming it on the students. <laughs> he yeah. said the oh, students they're lying are about full. homework. It, yeah. It's it's, it's, the secrecy sensor. Yeah. Well, that's another that's thing it. that works both ways. It works on so many levels. It's like the idea yeah. that any of these devices would help you discern where somebody's being tricky or sneaky when you have a school setting where people or kids will lie about whether they did their homework or not. Kids will lie. I mean, anything. It's the perfect facade. Well, yeah. That, that's that's really what it is. Yes. It, when I was reading this, it made me think, well, can't you kind of fine tune these to sort of tune out the silly, uh, the silly stuff like students lying about their homework, things that mm. ultimately don't matter, and just fine tune it so it's only detecting the darkest of magic. You would think Moody would do that because he doesn't care typically about students lying to each other about who they like and the everyday nonsense that happens in school. And he just he's fakie is a thrill seeker. Junior's a thrill seeker because he always he also says around this scene. He said, oh, these actually could be alerting us to something more than just childhood nonsense. Like He's basically asking Harry to think about it deeper. You know, and it's possible that Fakey did and and has fine-tuned his dark detectors, but if somebody's in his office, he's going to give the excuse, oh, like, th- this is because of all the students. So, obviously, his folk yeah. class, if, you know, if we see Snape in there later, that should be that clue, exactly that clue, and, it, and it's a very good clue, but... I think what I like the most about these dark detectors is they're non-discriminatory. They're going off because you have the biggest imposter in the room with you who (laughs) has nefarious, like the sneakoscope is almost trying to clue Harry, you know, but the, the alibi for it is fantastic. Why does he have these in there just to sell the moody image? Yeah. Sell his persona. I mean, think back to the beginning. Yeah, I'm paranoid all the time. Yeah, of the book with the trash cans and everything that happened when he was claiming that somebody was in his yard, and he's he's uh, on edge all the time. That's that's who the real Moody is as a character, right? Yeah, I I like to believe that Barty Crouch didn't have to buy anything to decorate this office. He just like scooped up all the dark detectors that were like around the perimeter of real Moody's house. (laughs) Um, because I think in the book it says like oh Harry had been in this office twice and once there were pictures of Lockhart when Lockhart was in there when Lupin was in there it was stuff in tanks but for Mad-Eye it's it's this it's these dark (laughs) detectives it's a neurotic aura who thinks there's something around every corner well right it just fits the character as we think it would be perfectly like even if real Moody had come back to Hogwarts and taught next year I doubt he would have changed the office much Catherine, you saw some foreshadowing happening here too, right? I did. And I kind of I guess I just mi- I missed it, you know, reading it as a child and then rereading it. But Moody mentions to Harry, you know, as they're talking about, you know, the, he's talking about the faux glass and he's talking about the sneakoscopes. And he was like, you know, if, if I see the whites of their eyes, I'm going to head towards my trunk. And he points over to the trunk. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, that's where he's keeping Moody. Yeah. OG Moody, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. like, well, that's kind of, you know, and we as readers are not, you know, official, especially our first time through, we're not, okay, he's got a trunk. Okay, cool. Maybe it's an escape hatch or maybe it's like, you know, Newt's commanders and like the Fantastic Beast where he's got like, you know, corridors in there or something, but you're not thinking he's 
holding a prisoner there. No. Yeah. It works so well at setting up the most terrifying thing in this room is in this trunk. And Harry's such a good student, like he's not going to ask. He's just going to be like, oh, I better stay away from that trunk in some case something comes out and bites me. Like it's so perfect at how it like, and also it, it fits with what we know of Barty Crouch Jr.'s character that he's drawing attention to it because he thinks that he is brilliant. And it's, it's just like when they were in the uh, trophy room yeah. and he says, this is exactly how what somebody must have done to confund the Goblet of mm-hmm. Fire. It's exactly that, where he's like, oh, in this trunk, I would absolutely go straight to it. It's like, wow, you can get away that's, with a lot. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's, it's reminiscent of that conversation that he had in front of some very important people where he revealed exactly what he did and nobody picked up on it. But let's also remember Harry's 14 years old. So if you're a 14 year old in your teacher's office, you're, you're going to be pretty careful, cautious around all of the things that they have there. You're not going to go poking in and see what they have (laughs) in, uh, you know, maybe you would Andrew. I well, can no, see you no, no. I mean, Justin's bringing up a good point in our Discord. I mean, we're talking about the same Harry who's gone into the Forbidden Forest, who's gone down and, you know, faced Fluffy and beaten Fluffy. Like, he's not afraid to poke around and see what's going on. No, but I think he's afraid of Moody. I do think there's something okay. in him that is fearful of Moody, not necessarily in a bad way, but in a cautious way. Yeah. We'll talk more about that in a moment. I did want to bring up, though, I had to look up this quote because... Regarding his faux glass, Moody says, I'm not really in trouble till I see the whites of their eyes. Something about the whites of their eyes rang a bell for me. So I did Google just that phrase. And it was something that was said to the Revolutionary War soldiers in uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill. General Putnam said to the American troops, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes, uh, meaning the British troops. And so it was truly the closest you could get. Also, muskets were very limited, Um, but it was like the range that they had to get to for most success. And so I think that this is probably an intentional reference just in general about like wartime. And it, to me, it just hits all the notes. I find it to be a delicious phrase. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good catch. Muggle cast 652, the Battle of Bunker Hill. <laughs> like, what? A history lesson? Or the okay. Battle of Stoateshead Hill. But I guess that's uh, when they attack the borough. <laughs> Also, just wanted to throw out this chest that Moody has, has seven locks on it. Just, I like catching those seven and 12 references. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a lot, but also I guess that's paranoid Moody for you. He can't trust one, two, three, four, five, even six locks. It has to be seven. You're only as strong as the weakest lock. True that. One lock for every Horcrux, if you're thinking of making those. (laughs) Isn't seven the most magically powerful number of locks to have? I've got six on my front door. I think I need to add a seventh. Oh my God. This is inspiring me. I also think about it as with Moody as well. You know, he's he's an R. He's some he's seen some pretty scary things. You know, would not surprise me if he's got some like some PTSD going on. So having those seven locks may make him feel a lot better than having six. Also, LOL at Moody saying he told Dumbledore that Karkaroff and Maxime would definitely be cheating when it came to the games. To show that Dumbledore is only human. They want to beat Dumbledore that bad. They really want to show that he's only human. Um, This made me think, though, maybe this is some evidence that Dumbledore did ask Hagrid to bring Harry into the Forbidden Forest to show him the dragons. Mm -hmm. Because could Dumbledore have thought Harry would then pass this info along to Cedric? Because Harry always does the right thing. So here's an example of Dumbledore being... The puppet master not getting involved himself, keeping his hands somewhat clean, but he suggests to Hagrid that he do it. So then Harry would then pass it on to Cedric and Dumbledore doesn't have to tell either Harry or Cedric. I like it. I will say it is confirmed later that Moody did tell Hagrid to take Harry out so that uh, he himself wouldn't have to. But the interesting thing about this, we like we understand Harry. Moody says to Harry, play to your strengths. But before that, he says, I'm not going to tell you how to do the first task. I'm not going to tell you. He says, I'm just going to give you general advice. And it's this Uh beautiful, it's this, right? It's this wonderful (laughs) thing where he's like, I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. And he leads him to the the whole thing. Like, you know, use your broom. They're breadcrumbs. They're breadcrumbs. Yeah. But by saying, I'm not going to tell you, sets him like, 
mental psychologically harry's just like oh okay you're not going to tell me and then so he doesn't suspect that anything about where this information is coming from or what moody's own personal interest in his success might be the the amount of knowledge that fake moody imparts upon the students could fill up in another entire episode of muggle cast and we could debate um because i think we've gotten feedback from listeners about what's the true intention behind what Barty Crouch Jr. is doing here and doesn't have a lot to do with how he was raised and how he was treated by his father. But again, another discussion for another time. However, Andrew, I I wanted to say this is a really great catch that you had about Dumbledore being only human because I actually think it's a dig by Barty Crouch Jr. because he's hiding in plain sight and he's saying Dumbledore is only human he can't recognize certain things. And this is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. I love that. On a related note, I mean, Dumbledore doesn't ever go into Moody's office and see all these dark detectors (laughs) and see them spinning. And he wouldn't be like, there's no way you have these tuned to detect homework lies. Like that would be a red flag to me if I was walking into Moody's office. I think we've established that there is little to no oversight of the professors at Hogwarts. Mm-hmm. Like, and Moody can be trusted. Think, He's an or and yeah. And I just don't think that Dumbledore is dropping in unannounced on these teachers to kind of check out what it is they're doing. Yeah, I think everybody's kind of siloed. Honestly. All right. Well, on that note, we will go check in on Moody since nobody else is at the school. We'll be right back after these messages. So returning to the chapter, going a little bit further along, Harry gets with best friend Hermione and says, you need to help me. She's exhausted. She's been helping him all week. Uh, But he says, we need to practice summoning charms. And, you know, they do that. It's a really wonderful thing for Hermione to to do, which I feel like is has was actually very Uh, well covered on the all girls episode last week as well about what Hermione puts in to her relationship with Harry and how she helps him and (laughs) gives him life in almost a motherly way. Speaking of mothers though, Minerva McGonagall, who is very matronly toward Harry in the next book has this moment that I often forget exists in that she is able to walk Harry down to the actual first task and You know, it's an interesting little scene. Uh, She says to Harry, now don't panic. Just keep a cool head. We've got wizards standing by to control the situation if it gets out of hand. The main thing is just do your best and nobody will think any of the worse of you. Are you all right? And she says, you're to go in here with the other champions in a bit of a shaky sort of voice. And she says, and wait for your turn, Potter. Mr. Bagman is in there. He'll be telling you the... And then she chokes up and says, the procedure, good luck. McGonagall cares about Harry, y'all. Yeah, and I think she's also probably thinking, my goodness, he does not have any parents to look out for him during this terrifying experience he's about to go through. Presumably, she knows about the dragons that they all are about to face. She feels terrible that Harry is going through yet another traumatic experience. I do want to correct myself. That first quote is actually from Hermione, but we see the parallel between Hermione and Minerva, both just wanting the best of Harry, telling him it's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting moment we get to see because we know where McGonagall was the day that Harry's parents died. She was at Privet Drive begging Dumbledore to find better parents for Harry. So it's just really interesting because you know pre the would have a biscuit potter scene um and pre career advice i'm going to do everything i can to make sure this kid becomes an horror you just don't get a lot of direct mcgonagall harry action it makes you wonder how many times behind the scenes she has pleaded and begged with dumbledore uh, to do something different mm-hmm. for harry <laughs> We just didn't get to see it. Yeah. Like stopped him from being in the tournament, you mean? Or yeah, well, just, yeah, knowing that yeah. McGonagall is is at Hogwarts is the only reason I think that Harry's case can't be helped for being in the goblet. Because if there was a way to take him out of it, McGonagall would have fought for yeah. that because this is BS. Mm-hmm. 
Do we have any more insight into sort of McGonagall's state of mind here? You can clearly see she's upset. Like, she is upset that Harry could be hurt or worse. I mean, isn't that what the goblet, like, the whole thing was like, you could, like, not be alive anymore? And there is nothing she can do about it. You know, it's, you know, I I was, I went and actually looked up because I couldn't remember, but like, there's essentially like a binding contract when they go into the tournament. It's like, you can't, there's like, you can't get out of it. And for me, like outside of Molly, McGonagall's, McGonagall's the only, you know, stable motherly figure that Harry really has. You know, I don't think she would want any of her students hurt by any means, but you think about it, that those that are in the, like Cedric is of legal age in the wizarding world. Harry's not. So that adds an extra layer of he's only 14, not even a legal adult in the terms of the wizarding world. And there's nothing I can do to help him other than just walk him down here and just wish him luck. That's all I can do. And for a mother, like I'm not a mother myself, but I couldn't even imagine like sending my child to do that or someone I view as my child off to something I can't control. I have no control over it. It's going to tear her up a bit. Yeah, there's no question the bond between Harry and McGonagall is really strong. We see it in Deathly Hallows when Amicus Caro spits on McGonagall, and it causes Harry to use one of the unforgivable curses as a result of that. So they are very much connected to each other. And I do think to the points that were raised, it goes all the way back to Sorcerer's Stone when Harry was first left on the doorstep. And she is one of those motherly, grandmotherly figures for him because he doesn't have anybody else. Somebody brought that up earlier. Trace Gatto said Minerva is Ma-merva. Aww. Ma-merva. Aww. Yeah, I think it says a lot that there aren't more motherly moments between Minerva and Harry in the books because it shows actually McGonagall's restraint. Despite her obvious feelings towards Harry, she is also equally committed to fairness and she's also, except for the thing with mm-hmm. the Nimbus 2000 in year one, we don't really talk about that. Uh, I, I saw a <laughs> meme today where it was like, this wand needs replacing Weasley. And Ron's like, well, can you get me a new wand? Like you got Harry a broom? And she says, no. And he's <laughs> like, oh God, okay. So yeah, not all Gryffindors are treated equally, but there's this impression that McGonagall is fair in everything that she does. And I, just to my point earlier, I think that's why we don't get more motherly moments but it's nice because the gears are very much still turning. Absolutely. Now, this question also, this uh, discussion also leads us into talking about the stakes of this first task. McGonagall is obviously very concerned for all the points that were brought up before. Harry's underage. Not only is Harry underage, but he has the most dangerous dragon. They draw lots, and he gets, of course, the Hungarian horntail, the one that Charlie Weasley was like, watch out for that one, Hagrid. (laughs) Literally, Hagrid... (laughs) Any of these other ones you'd be fine with, but watch out because the horn tail's particularly dangerous. I I gotta ask the question. Why is there a difficulty difference in these dragons? Should they not either be all of the same breed? Just the idea that a 14-year-old could get the most dangerous dragon is absurd. I guess that's part of the entertainment value that's happening here. Like if it's the same four dragons, it gets a little repetitive. Potentially the four people competing in the competition could share notes and like work together to figure out the best way to defeat the dragon because we all know they're all fighting out in advance anyway. And apparently the people running this tournament know that too. (laughs) So I just I just think it makes it more exciting. And plus there's the element of drawing from the bag and seeing what dragon that you get. And that's just the luck of the draw. With the little number around its neck, like that yeah. was <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh <laughs> I, I guess if you have the same dragon though, won't the dragon get tired? Or are you saying having four of the same type of dragon? Well, right. Like, so I get the colors are different and that's exciting visually to the audience, but like, why is the <laughs> difficulty level like the horn tail is at least doubly dangerous? Apart from breathing fire, but he's got the spice. That's just part of the game, I think. According to who though, because you'd have to assume that there are certain traits that each of these dragons have that could be just as dangerous depending on the circumstance. I think we're just presuming that the Horntail is the most dangerous of the lot, right? Because it's Harry's dragon and because of all the hubbub that was made about it when Harry found it in the forest. So I don't know. I'm sure the Chinese fireball 
is pretty damn dangerous. I'm sure the Welsh green is pretty damn dangerous. Like, so I just think as Andrew was saying earlier, it, it's part of the, the Triwizard tournament. It's, it's just part of the excitement, the draw, right? It, it, and you know what? Harry's not supposed to be there anyway. That fourth dragon is not supposed to be there anyway. So yeah, which one was the fourth? Yeah, which one was the one they brought? Probably on? the horn tail. <laughs> well, they're like well, for extra stakes. Like, oh, a fourteen-year-old has joined the competition. We need to grab a fourth dragon. Quick, grab the most dangerous one. I don't think it's super easy to like request a dragon for on loan. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they've planned this out months in advance, presumably, and they probably had to go about finding a fourth dragon really quickly, and could only take what they could get. I, I don't we, assume that dragons are very easy to get. <laughs> didn't we talk about them having a fourth dragon on standby in case like one of the dragons was feeling sick that day or something like that? That would have been interesting. Like, it would make sense for them to have a backup dragon for any number of reasons. The dragon called out sick. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel bad for all of these dragons, side note. Um, but also <laughs> the dragons are on a reservation or the dragons are kept in captivity because otherwise it would be a breaking of the statute of secrecy. So they are kept in places like where Charlie Weasley works. Um, and so I do think that they wouldn't have had to like go wrangle one. Uh, they would have had to, you know, bring a fourth one probably last minute. And that to me makes the argument that one of them is significantly more challenging is like that maybe it's that the other three dragons whoever they were were more evenly matched but then we get this horn tail like which just i'm sorry again micah you can't convince me that the common welsh green so-called is as scary as even the chinese fireball you can't all right you go tickle a sleeping oh, common welsh green and tell me how it goes i think for i'll you. survive more likely than if it were the horn tail but Catherine, you have solved this to within an inch of uh, our discussion here, I, I'm so happy with the solution that you've presented as far as points and the dragon's difficulty. Please share. Okay. So I'm like a huge video game player. And when, you know, how you have different levels of the difficulty, you've got, you know, easy, medium, master mode, whatever. And so I was like, if they wanted to have different dragons, shouldn't each dragon be worth so many like additional points to your score? Mm -hmm. So like, again, like playing on a different level of di like, you know, of a video game. So the horn tail being since there's four, you know, that seems to be seemingly the most dangerous dragon. So you would get four points added to your total score versus like the common Welsh green. Maybe it's the, you know, in, in the four that they have, it's the le least difficult. So it'd be more like easy modes so you get, but you get one additional point. Right. It like made that. sense in my video game brain. Yeah, like, no, that makes, yeah. No, to that makes the, total sense. If you're not wanting to have it where we're all facing the same dragon or it's, you know, whether it be the same dragon repeatedly or there's four common Welsh greens or whatever. That was kind of my thought process. I love it. I was thinking similarly to Catherine, although I think Catherine's approach is a lot more efficient than mine, but I was almost thinking of the way that when you see a lot of different kinds of competitions happening, the judges will rate um, the competitors based on a number of categories like difficulty, creativity, um, technique, and they get different individual scores for all of those. And the score that they ultimately give them is like a, comp a composite score. Um, so I was like, maybe they're doing that. But uh, then I got to the end of the chapter and I remembered, oh, no, that's not what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> that's not it. It's funny because we heard Karkaroff in a previous chapter talk about how many months of plannings when all these meetings that they had about how to do this tournament. And like he gives Harry a four. And you can just tell that every single judge in this competition has no supervision. There are no rules. There is no repercussions. You can just do whatever you want and show blatant favoritism. I know it's skipping ahead a little bit, but like literally all this planning and no, every judge is their own island. There is no like summing up of the total scores at all. It's a miracle anybody wins with all the other schools behaving the way Karkaroff might. Yeah. I did find it interesting that 
Bagman. At, so after the dragons are pulled, like nobody's having a reaction. Like, oh my gosh, we're facing dragons! Wow, I'm so surprised. Like they don't try to fake it. Now, sure, maybe they were like yep. a little. You could argue they were stressed, but we also know that they knew going into this they'd yeah. be facing dragons. So. I'm surprised Bagman didn't say like, oh, I'm surprised you guys aren't reacting or looking scared or something like that. I guess it just speaks to the fact that even Bagman and the people organizing this tournament know that the secret's been out and the secrets already get out. It just sat weird to me. Like everything's like normal. Like if I were Bagman, I'd be like, huh? So what do you guys think? Huh? 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 <laughs> I've always thought Ludo Bagman was a little dense, in my opinion. So he was not, he was not the most impressive of the uh, ministers of magic, in my opinion. But okay, so okay. he it might have gone over his head that no one was having a reaction. There is know. definitely a reason why he wasn't adapted. His character wasn't adapted into the movies, I think. And it's, it's maybe due to some of these similar flaws. Mm -hmm. The movie mm. adaptation, though, of this particular scene to, to kind of answer that question i thought was really well done because you did get that emotional reaction from the four champions as they were drawing the dragons out of the bag and you had barty kraut senior chinese fireball Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> harry muttering under his breath hungarian horntail and barty kraut senior reacting to that almost you know wait what did you say boy mm. you know and <laughs> so it was much better done you didn't need the the character of Ludo there. Um, it it kind of falls flat in comparison. Um, this moment in the in the actual book falls flat by comparison. I would say. Yeah, um, you know. And speaking of Bagman, he says to Harry, "Use a direct quote from the book. Got a plan?" Then he lowers his voice conspiratorially. He says, "Because I don't mind sharing a few pointers if you'd like them. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you're the underdog here, Harry. Anything I can do to help." It's like, <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. we see what we see what Bagman gives Harry, but it's just cheating is rampant. That's literally all this is. That's why he's mm -hmm. not surprised mm -hmm. anyone knows about the trades. It's literally what Moody says that he, like Moody to, or Fakey tells Harry, the other professors absolutely would have told their kids to cheat because that's just the history of this tournament, the proud tradition of this tournament. It seems... Right, with Bagman offering to help Harry at the last minute. I th And I think Harry rejected it because he wants things to stay fair. And for him to get some last minute info from Ludo would kind of make things unfair. Now, that said, they've all been preparing in their own ways anyway. So I'm not sure what Ludo could have given him. That would have definitely given him a, a leg up. Um, so maybe it wouldn't have made things more unfair. Ludo's probably placing bets on it as well and trying to rig things in his favor. Yeah. He owes the goblins a lot of galleons. Maybe Ludo, I, I doubt it because Charlie was having a hard time controlling the dragons, but maybe he's got like some secret hack that automatically gets the dragon to move off the eggs. Like, you know, you press the fourth toe on the <laughs> left leg. Yeah. And the dragon flies away. You know, some secret button. Like the Whomping Willow. <laughs> right, the Whomping Willow. I, I honestly love it. It is very Willow-esque. I love that idea, Andrew, though, because it's like at this point, this late in the game, what advice would, you know, Bagman really have been able to give Harry, especially knowing Harry's got the most dangerous dragon. Sorry, Mike, I'm going to keep saying that. It's the most dangerous dragon. And... I just think, what could he possibly told Harry? It's not like Harry can go off and learn the summoning charm if he hadn't already prepared for a day and a half straight of spellcasting. No advice Bagman gives Harry would be uh, implementable. To go back to the comment that was made about betting by Laura, I think there's actually a comment that Bagman makes while he's commentating. Was it about covering the spread? There's something at the very end of the tournament that he says, or the first task uh, that he says, that would lead you to believe that he's very much playing the odds on his own. I have to look it up. Uh, but the one thing I did want to bring up is pulling Harry aside, trying to give him this advice, trying to give him this edge. Does it raise any suspicions on our end? Like, Does it move him up the suspect board a little bit about dropping his name in the Goblet of Fire? Because why else would you want to help Harry. 
Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 you mentioned the gambling as did Laura, like maybe it's just as simple as that. And by the way, the line from Bagman was, well, you look at that. Our youngest champion is quickest to get his egg. Well, this is going to shorten the odds on Mr. Potter. Uh, Shorten the odds. There you go. Oh, yeah. yeah, there it is. So yeah, I guess that answers your question. <laughs> it's all about the money. Totally peeing himself. And what from one Quidditch player to another, when he sees Harry on his broom, I bet he just loves that as well. All right. Well, we'll get to Harry's relationship with Ron and that comeback in a moment. But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. So coming back off of that lovely ad break, we have another return, and it is uh, Ron coming back to Harry. And it's a beautiful scene where I think we could have gotten a little bit more out of it, but Harry has really been wanting um, to have Ron back. And there's this moment earlier in the chapter in Divination where his and Ron's eyes meet for the first time in several weeks, and you know they still can't look at each other, they still can't talk to each other, but finally... After Harry succeeds in what I think is the most phenomenal showing of the first task, um, Ron comes in and actually apologizes. Or he would apologize if Harry doesn't say it's nothing, and then he just totally lets it (laughs) go. Yeah, he he was ready to jump on him. I would have absolutely seen or loved to have seen what Ron would have said. But I, all he manages to get out is, you know, I think I think you'd have to be a nutter to to really put your name in. So that's kind of all that Harry needs to just be like, okay, we're friends. Hermione sucked so badly; it was horrible without you. <laughs> I'm willing to forgive Ron because Ron's riding high on Harry's win. I think he has a fresh appreciation for Harry. That's a good point. I'm sure Ron was very stressed about Harry being in this task too. Deep down, of course, he was going to get back with Harry at some point. The question was just when. And what better opportunity than when he's so excited that Harry did phenomenal in the first task. I think it really does take a life or death situation the way... The thing that I thought of this go-around was that Ron's sort of realization mirrors Molly's. Uh, when the when everyone goes off to the Quidditch World Cup and she has that shouting match at Fred and George about their joke shop or whatever, and you know they come back to the borough and she's in tears and says, what if the last thing I ever said to you was, you know, whatever it was. And so yeah. I think Ron has that moment where he's like, if Harry had died, because it's very realistic that Harry could have died when he faced this dragon, I would have not been supporting him as a friend at that time. Yeah, that's a great parallel. It really drives it home. I love that. Yeah, just imagining Ron being in the stands and watching his best friend, who he's been fighting with for weeks, nearly face his death. I mean, to be a fly in the stands, (laughs) I guess we could say, to actually just see the evolution of Ron in those moments go from still being really pissed at Harry to all of a sudden seeing what he's actually up against. It makes it real. And how jarring it yeah. would be. Yeah, uh, that's something that I would also like to see in a TV show, more of like an introspective focus on that kind of thing. To add to that, like, I love Rana's character. I do. I think the movies do not do him justice sometimes. Um, but he's very stubborn, as we've seen. Mm-hmm. And we also know that he wants to be the best. Like no one ever was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, case in point, look at, I mean, hearkening back to the first book. What does he see in the mirror of Erised? You know, I've got the Quidditch Cup and I'm the house boy and I'm a prefect. He wants to be the best. While I think he never like. He loves Harry. We clearly see it throughout the book. He does. I mean, you don't put your you don't put yourself in situations if you don't love your friends, you know, especially dangerous situations. But we see his jealousy throughout the entire series. Every time you turn around, there's something he's mad at. I mean, and if you're I mean, like to use one of my favorite phrases, the connecting the threads. I mean, think about to Deathly Hallows when he's got the locket. Why does he leave? Mm -hmm. He's so jealous that Hermione's with Harry and, you know, everything. So, I mean, that's amplifying his jealousy even more. That is like a common thread throughout these books. 
But I also agree. I think it does take seeing Harry compete in this task and realizing, oh no, I could have not had my best friend anymore for him to to shake him out of that jealousy and come to his senses. Yeah. I I think that dragon served up a big piece of humble pie to Ron. (laughs) Absolutely. Mm -hmm. He's got some work to do. I'm not going to lie. I'm not, I'm not back on the Ron train just yet. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Gotta win Mike uh, over still. Disappointment there. Yeah. It's just like, I love that you can, though, see it coming. Ron has been reminded, as Harry has, what makes their friendship special. I, I'm sure, like, R- Harry has been feeling that Hermione couldn't offer the same thing. And Ron, like, he catches Harry joking in divination about, glad I'm going to die quickly, Trelawney. And you see that almost smile, or Harry notices the almost smile, and it's like Ron is being reminded, just as Harry is, that things are more fun when they're friends. And so it's really lovely that you have that divination scene leading up to the first task, and then kind of the payoff is here. And it's cool to be friends with Harry. Like, maybe this reminded him of that as well. I think I was alluding to this a couple weeks ago, too. Like, he should be... I get that Ron's young, but... So he doesn't really see the full picture, but he should be really lucky to have Harry, the chosen one, as his bestie. And when you're a ce- when you're friends with a celebrity, that's what's going to happen sometimes. Like they're going to be getting a lot of the spotlight, but you know that Harry is a good person. So just learn to roll with it. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens when I hang out with Andrew and everybody <laughs> comes over and wants pictures and <laughs> autographs. And, you know, it's it's annoying, but somehow I cope. Yeah, you cope, and then I go and defeat a dragon, and you're like, "Oh, he's he's cool. I can I can roll with this." So Ron and Harry are besties now, and uh, Ron fills them in on what happens with other players. Yes, and and that's another great thing is Ron's delivering the play by play, and it's like it's great to see Ron engaged, but Harry wants to know like this is what they bond over constantly, sport and this kind of. Yeah, not gossip, but like it's just the perfect fit to have them back together. And I did want to ask because I gush about how Harry handled this whole situation. It's just wild. Um, but was there another sort of champion whose performance we also really liked? And here's a small recap of what everyone did. So Cedric Diggory transformed a rock into a Labrador dog to distract the dragon. It sort of worked, according to Ron, but halfway through the dragon changed its mind and Cedric got burned. Uh, Fleur Delacour managed to subdue her dragon somehow, but wasn't counting on its snores to also emit fire, so she got burned. Uh, And Victor Crumb hit the dragon in the eyes with a spell, kind of confusing it but it went around in a rage and then crushed some of the eggs. Hmm. So all the champions got their their eggs, but none of them, including Harry, were unscathed. Which was your favorite, Catherine? I kind of liked uh, Fleur's, like, subduing the dragon. And I almost was, I was thinking about it today. I was wondering if, because, you know, she is part Vila. And I was like, I wonder if, like, because it's another magical, she's, you know, another magical being, if, you know her like villainess was able to come out and she was able to put it to sleep somehow. Mm. Mm. I mean, and that's a pretty, and like, that's pretty powerful. Like they talk about how like dragon hide skin is so tough and you, you know, that's why their gloves are made out of it for, you know, herbology and stuff. That's pretty powerful magic. That's really mm-hmm. an interesting point. I would like to see that match to that personally, like mm. to actually see. Yeah. In- she, said, she said the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's ready with the button. Yes. Uh, <laughs> nobody brought the pokey flute. Come on. I'm just saying. I was thinking pokey flute earlier when you said like, what would Bagman do? Like he'd slip him like pokey flute and be like, here, put the dragon to sleep. But I mean, that would be, you know, I think it'd be cool to see if we do get our TV show to see all of these done because we, yeah. we are only in Harry's head. It'd be nice to actually right. see more. So, yeah, I I love what you said there, Catherine, about Fleur because. I think Ron says that she put the dragon in some kind of trance. Is that right? And it made me think of the way that Ron reacts when he's around Fleur and when he's been around Vila before. So I think you're right. There's some kind of crossover of whatever magic that is. And her wand has the Vila hair in it as well. Mm-hmm. That's so, interesting. Yep. I, went and looked that, I looked call. that up too. I was like, doesn't it, isn't like, and it's uh, like, according to the wiki, it's her great, her grandmother's 
hair. Yeah. So maybe there's like that extra connection on top of it. Not only is she Vila, but it's like, per, like, you know, that lineage as well. That was my thought. Yeah. Can, I don't know. Yeah. What the, what the it's author a, was it's thinking a lady about dragon. There. So that's can, interesting. Can I ask yeah. a question though, um, to Catherine and to Laura coming off the heels of last week's episode, got me thinking reading this particular chapter, because we know that Cedric gets burned right on his actual skin but fleur only gets her skirt burned and i just feel like the way that that was written is is there anything more to read into there is there a message that the author is trying to send oh that's a really interesting question maybe not maybe i'm thinking i like more. the question too yeah no, I do like yeah. the question. I'm trying to consider it. I guess like Fleur's not tough first... enough to have burns like Cedric or Crumb. Like yeah. or it's, it's got to be her skirt. To, yeah, to wear like a flowy skirt to battle is like really like it's a bad decision. What was she thinking? Picking something with a skirt like that type of thing could be yeah. both of those things. I also wonder like how <sighs> do we get Fleur's and Cedric's scores? Because I know we find out the placement of Harry and Crumb. I, right? I, have, I have my book. We can find out. I'm like, oh, you have the <laughs> illustrated edition. Oh, yes. What I'm wondering is if if Fleur is in fourth place after this, I call BS. Because she didn't get her flesh burned. And she actually had a pretty effective approach for dealing with this dragon so in my opinion she should definitely not be dead last and i'm wondering if we get an indication of where she ranks as far right as now yeah i don't know about right now but standings wise yeah. we do get an update because fleur has to sit out the second uh task mm -hmm. like she can't handle it psychologically which that's probably saying something um about fleur but the uh explanation everything to do with points in this book is just leading up to the harry and cedric tie like from a plot standpoint like i can't get to i can't get too deep into what does the scoring mean because i'm just like you know at the end it has to be harry mm -hmm. and cedric quick rook is no we do not get any scores okay other than the fact that which we'll get to in a minute in our the thing about back about you know cargroff being unfair towards harry but no, yeah. there was no score for Fleur. But I agree, Laura. Like, there's that's not, you know, she doesn't need to be dead last for that. Exactly. She didn't get a, a single burn at all. You know, she, you know, if we're going by that, Cedric should be last. He's the one that got kind of burned up more. Poor guy. Mm -hmm. God bless him. <laughs> God bless. Bless his heart. <laughs> bless him. He bless tries. <laughs> It is interesting to me that everybody had a different way of tackling this. And also everybody kind of sort of hacked it. Like nobody fought the dragon except for maybe Crumb because he shot this shot the spell at the dragon's eye. But everybody else like, you know, Harry with the firebolt, Cedric <laughs> with turning a rock into a dog and having the dog destroy. That's the most random one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's hacky. I like that though. I it's it's um trying to distract, right? It's it's a decoy. I want to fight though. Yeah. Fight, fight, fight. But also that honestly, that's real life. Hacking it. Mm -hmm. Honestly, make it till you make the it. The older I get, mm -hmm. hack it. <laughs> the more situations I find myself in, it's like what can you do to get the thing done efficiently and like mostly correctly so you can get it over with as soon as possible yes. <laughs> it, it would have blown my teenage mind when i was first reading this book to learn that adults don't have their ish together and aren't like ever there's a plan for everything and an escape plan like it would have blown my mind now being an adult being mid-30s and being like how much of it is just hacking it yeah most of it. Imagine the, the <laughs> like, all of these students were supposed to go into this task without prior knowledge of what they were about to face. Yeah. So they There's were no able <laughs> to hone in on what it was they wanted to do to try and get the egg away from the dragon. Now, this might not be a popular the uh, statement here, but I never liked the way that Harry got the egg from the dragon. I thought summoning his broom for a guy who just learned how to summon days ago, 24 hours ago, whatever it was, right. it's a cop-out. 
And how far away is the Firebolt? It's up in Gryffindor Tower. He's down in the forest. The distance, the magic that that would require, he was only summoning things from across a room, not from across an entire field all the way out in the school. But he was, de- he was determined. He I was think determined. Hermione was driving that home. You got to be determined. Yeah, okay. So how far away can you summon your vibrating broom, Andrew, right now, if you wanted to? <laughs> <laughs> Let me try right now. Hold on. I got my Muggle cast wand right here, actually. Andrew's on his broom right now. Joke's on you. It's, it's only a few feet away. It, it won't be too difficult. I agree with you, but I think that what bothers me most is that he's bringing in an outside object, like he's calling it in. Mm -hmm. Like you should only be able to fight to complete the task with the things that you have in your possession currently or that are in the environment, like Cedric. That's a good point. Turning. Yep. That's what bothered me. I remember when I first read this book. Well, I think that the reason the broom is all the way up in the castle is for the suspense of did it work? Did it not work? Did it work? Did it not work? It makes it very Mm -hmm. exciting because very reasonably, Harry's firebolt could have been in Hagrid's broom closet. We know that the gamekeeper, we know that there's spare brooms and training brooms that are just in a cupboard on the grounds somewhere. And the firebolt, for all they know, like this task could have been done on the Quidditch pitch with that broom closet right there. And Harry's a uh, remarkable summoning charm wouldn't have necessarily been that much cooler. Like it's just for a dramatic effect that the thing was all the way up there. So I, I don't know. I, I give Harry a lot of credit with this. I think that if all you're given is your wand, you do exactly what Moody says. You play to your strengths. It would have been the same if Harry learned transfiguration and transfigured a rock into a broom, like mm-hmm. instead of a dog, like, you know, it would have been the same thing of, Using what you have there, I think it still counts. It falls flat for me, though, because you also have two other participants in this tournament who are exceptional Quidditch players. Mm. So the whole idea of playing to your strength, Cedric doesn't do it. Crumb doesn't do it. But Harry does it. And you can argue Harry's strength. I mean, he's a great Quidditch player. Don't get me wrong. But Defense Against the Dark Arts is probably more of a practical strength than flying is for him. Mm-hmm. I think the issue is, though, again, the vector rushed. is... It was all rushed. This is what happens when it's rushed. <laughs> yeah, well, no, the, the vector is his age again, because what Hermione says is they have never learned to transfigure anything alive yet at this point. By year seven, you absolutely would have done that at Hogwarts. But Harry mm-hmm. just... like The summoning charm represents the maximum possible skill level of magic that Harry at his current age could possibly do and still do well enough that it's reliable. And that's why I like it. It's truly like Harry reaching up and touching like higher magic, like when he learns the Patronus charm. Like Harry is good at this stuff. I mean, would they even have learned Confundus by now? Probably so, not. Right. Because I was thinking that, you know, you could like, maybe that's what Fleur used to, you know, confuse the dragon or whatever. But I mean, that's a higher level skill. And he's only, I mean, again, we have to think the age disparity between the three other champions and Harry. Yeah. But, but I kind of do agree that I thought the firebolt thing was kind of a cop out too. Oh, but man. I agree <laughs> Thank I you. Know. Thank you. I mean, summon, summon the egg. Why are you summoning your broom? Summon the egg. It would have been over oh, in 10 that's seconds. Oh, a good point. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. see, now, now I'm with you, Micah. Yeah. Well, how are you going to get the dragon off the egg? There was that. Summoning it. But <laughs> you can't summon a living thing. This isn't Fantastic Beasts and the Niffler. No, the, the egg's not living. <laughs> but the egg's not living. Well, oh, yeah, well, Accio egg. Well, you know what? It would definitely go Summon the dragon and get it off the egg, and then you go grab the egg. <laughs> Just you move know, around. You say move around a little oh, bit. Accio gold egg. Wait, since the egg is <laughs> gold, you could, butt. you could just get a Niffler since the egg is golden. There, and now you're thinking. Wait five <laughs> minutes. Wait five minutes. Let a lift the Niffler loose. Wait five minutes, and then they'll bring it back to you. But then, wow. what if the Niffler gets hurt? The Niffler won't get hurt. Casualty. But of that's war. when you do. You say Accio <laughs> Niffler or Accio Golden Egg, and the Niffler will have it in its pouch already. And certainly that wouldn't stop Cedric. I mean, he's sacrificing a dog here. Listen, and I'll circle we, back on this. In a we moment. were going to bring this up at some point in this episode, I'm sure. Anyway, but how do we feel? Because I like the broom thing. I think it's an elegant solution. I don't think it's a cop out. But I also am very, probably alone in liking the adaptation to the movie where they chase each other around I'm with, Hogwarts. I'm with you, Eric. I think you had to. In the movie, I think it. you absolutely... I didn't like it, but I think you had to do it. 
Yeah. If, if you were the director, you had to do it because if you're just going to do what happens in the book, it's just not, it's not exciting. It's, it's cinematic. not as visually pleasing. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, I thought I, when I was reading this chapter, I was like, that's all he did. I was like, what happened? I thought the draft, like, and because and I've not read the book for so long, I literally thought the movie was, the movieism was right. I was like, doesn't yeah. the dragon like chase him or do <laughs> yeah. something? Right. I'm like, okay, yeah, it snaps. It, it snaps a little bit. Okay. It, well, there's a level of deafness to what Harry has to do because the dragon is a mother that is going yeah. to guard its children. And so Harry is flying at a level that's neck and neck with the dragon. The dragon is predisposed to not go after him. And so right. it's actually very, very skillful for Harry to have to rock back and forth and kind of get it out of its own comfort zone to make the dragon essentially forget that it's protecting its eggs to then dive. I just think Harry's a genius and this is extremely good for him. Anyway, Harry uh, does not have a friend in Karkaroff. Karkaroff gives him probably a higher score than you would, Micah, but Karkaroff gives him a four. I don't. I wouldn't take away points. I, I just think the way it was written was kind of a cop yeah. out. So. so yeah, the scoring system, very unfair. I mean, there's just, for Karkaroff to give him a four, for Karkaroff to be judging. <laughs> oh, right. There's that. But, yeah. mm-hmm. yeah, there's... For any of these people to be judging, with the exception of Ludo, is is pretty nuts. None of them should be. None of the headmasters should be judging. And mm. I honestly think the Goblet of Fire should be the one to determine the score. That would have taken away a lot of the bias that we see from all of these participants. That's interesting. Because like, Ludo is also giving scores based on what he's yeah. betting on the side. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, this is all so messed up. You know, I I initially was like, the sorting hat, Micah? Like, oh, really? Like, can't we come up with another object? But there has been this recurring theme in Goblet of Fire, chapter by chapter thus far, where we're giving jobs to the sorting hat because he's so <laughs> bored the rest of the year when he's not sorting. Like, by the end of the series, I hope we have a long list of tasks no, that no, the sorting hat I, no, can no, the goblet. The I'm year. saying the goblet needs to do it. The goblet it caused oh, all this to it begin with. Brought, yeah, it would have brought the goblet. But the sorting hat could too. It would have brought the goblet to greater prominence throughout the book. And I actually really like that suggestion because if you think about it, for a book called The Goblet of Fire, The Goblet of Fire exists at the beginning of the book and that's it. After the names are drawn, it goes into its casket. But like the idea of an impartial judge, truly that. So the goblet's going to spit out its its score because yeah. it doesn't have a mouth like the sorting hat. We needed like a third or fourth. So the sorting hat is a judge. The goblet is a judge. <laughs> what are the other two? I said, pull out the mirror of Air said. Make, the, make them walk up and get their, <laughs> get their scores. Make them walk so up. Gonna like be a higher score do I get? Everyone's going to get a perfect just, score. Just say. Yeah. But that would be the impartial. Everybody gets a perfect score and then you have everything else. Well, I will say, look, pensive. everyone, I think <laughs> everyone's pretty judge. much... Everyone's pre- pretty evenly matched. Harry gets hurt by the spike tail. Everyone gets slightly burned or damages the eggs. There's there's a flaw in everyone's behavior, but nobody deserves a four. This isn't me coming for Karkaroff right now. A four is extremely low and somebody should have stopped him. That is absolutely unacceptable for that to be. They shouldn't even have fours. <laughs> I wonder what he gave Cedric yeah. and Fleur. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Telling you the TV show, you make it up. I know. Just say it. Give right? us answers. Exactly. Give us the answers we need. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and and you know, Bagman on the other hand gives a ten, and it's like that. Just like Andrew said, he's betting on the the returns. So it's like so clearly biased and flawed. But it is always fun to kind of just examine all the ways in which this is just bogus. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. You know, I was thinking about it, you know, coming since I do teach college. Is there not some kind of rubric? Like if they're going to have the headmasters, you know, as they shouldn't. And I fully agree. It should be like completely like, you know, not no one related to them at all. Is there not some kind of rubric they need to follow or some like standard guide of like, you know, these are the basics for like, you know, you get this many points for the amount of time to complete the task, the difficulty of the magic performed, etc. Yep. Your dragon. And I was thinking it, yeah, the, the dragon type, etc. But then I was also taking it back, to, you know, throwing it to the muggle world. Uh, we got the Olympics coming up in gymnastics. There are judges that are specifically judge the difficulty of a routine or a maneuver. And then there are judges mm-hmm. that specifically talk about the execution of the routine. 
So there's like 12 judges going on. And then how they score is it's a combined score of what the score for the difficulty and the difficulty of, and then like their execution of the routine minus any mistakes. So I'm like, why is that not a thing? Yeah. And it's weighted and it's fair and everybody gets the same exact treatment. It it essentially rules out judge bias. Exactly. You know, who's going to be super pissed after this moody. (laughs) Moody. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Oh, Oh, that's funny because Karkaroff directly hinders maybe Harry's chances of getting to the final. Like yeah. Moody sees that and has to step up his game to like either psych Karkaroff out or continue helping Harry along. Mm. Yep. Pretty interesting. Well, I believe that may wrap up our main discussions. Let's move on to the odds and ends of the chapter. So uh, something I thought was very fun is uh, it's easy to forget with movie adaptations being fresher in our minds. But in Hogwarts, in the books, the wizards, years one through seven, have pointy wizards caps. We only... I thought Mm -hmm. that the only pointy wizards cap reference was at the end of the first book when everyone's throwing off. It's very uh, French uh, Philosopher's Stone cover, if you've seen it. They all have the pointy caps there. But it turns out the opening sentence of this chapter is... Harry got up on Sunday morning and dressed so inattentively that it was a while before he realized he was trying to pull his hat, hello, hello, onto his foot instead of his sock. So his hat is still a part of Harry's uh, uniform in year four. I will say this is one of the movieisms that I kind of liked that they got away (laughs) from the caps because they look goofy. They're classic, though. It's classic wizard. Imagine sitting in a classroom trying to see your professor teach, but three rows of kids in front of you all are wearing oh. pointy wizards. Caps. You just have this like hat doing this, like, you know, moving back and forth. Yeah. Here's a catch. Um, Victor Crumb comes into the library. Hermione is devastated. She does this. She's like, oh, God, here he is again. Apparently, Victor Crumb has been coming to the library. And what Hermione does not like about it is that his whole entourage gaggle of girls comes and they're like, ah, oh, you know, Victor, whatever. But my question is, it is said that Victor comes right in and casts a surly look over at Hermione and Harry and then goes about with his day. But my question is, is this an early indicator that Victor Crumb might be coming to the library for Hermione? Is he trying to catch yeah, Hermione? Absolutely. OK, mm-hmm. I'm glad you absolutely. guys agree. Hey. Yeah, that's I'm pretty sure the only reason he goes. Mm-hmm. Hey, <laughs> look at that, though. He's smitten. Yeah. yeah, I think the look is for Harry specifically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think he's always surly, so I don't. I don't think that. Oh that yeah, is, there's, there's, you that. know, it's but true. but it's, it's a clever way of saying that Victor is looking at Hermione. Uh, well, speaking of being in the library, this was just a quick thing. It was like a blink and you'll miss it moment. Uh, Harry tosses aside a book called "Men Who Love Dragons Too Much." Uh oh. <laughs> And I, <laughs> it's reminded me I of like, a certain uh, Dumbledore. <laughs> if you catch my drift, and Micah's favorite animal, right? <laughs> and I'm, I'm just like, what is that book about? And Harry, how do you think that book is going to help you? I mean, uh, hey, well, he's looking for any help he can get. He's looking for dragon any facts. Answers. Coming up on bonus muggle cast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it just tickled me. What did you catch, Catherine? Um, I had two things. Um, the first, um, we go back to Harry in the tent and, you know, everyone else has gone and, you know, he's wait, said, um, is it, yeah, crumb crumb has left and he's alone in the tent and, you know, he's, you know, sitting there waiting and it's, I forgot what exactly what it said in the book, but essentially he's almost like he feels like out of body. Like the crowd is like away from him and the, the mm. noise in the distance yeah, and I was like, I I was reading it, and again from the per- psychology perspective, I was like, he's dissociating, like he's having an out, like an mm-hmm. out of body experience, and I'm sure we've all had those moments under like extreme high stress where we're like, you know, you feel kind of like dis, you know, out of your out of your own body, out of the space, everything around you is very, you know, different, and yeah, that's very common when you're in a very high stress environment. And I'm like, well, yeah, I would be pretty freaked out if I'm having to like go fight a dragon. 
Yeah. So you also was... experience this feeling when something shocking has happened. Exactly. Like out yeah. of the blue. A hundred percent. You know, those high moments of stress or anxiety can make us, you know, kind of come out of our own selves for a minute. Fortunately, yeah. he snaps back in and he's like, okay, I got to do this. But it's still, you know, it was a, um, I would not have caught that at reading it, you know, at, as a teenager, but now as yeah, an adult yeah. and having that experience and having stressful moments experience, it's like, yeah, I know exactly how that feels. It's I don't, know how, fight, I don't know how it is to fight a dragon, but I've had those <laughs> moments of stress and anxiety. You've been, you know, close to that type of situation, yeah, yeah. fighting a dragon, All fighting, All the time. fighting a, a fly, you know, scary stuff. Exactly. And then I also um, caught another like dragon connection and interaction dragon connection. Um, since, you know, book four is kind of smack dab in the middle of our seven, you know, in book one, we're introduced to dragons through Norbert. And then the fourth book, we have the first task is dragons. And then in book seven, we escape on a dragon through, from Green Gods. So oh, that's beautiful. I was, uh, and then also like, uh, connecting four and seven with flying with a dragon. So like yep. Harry's on his mm-hmm. firebolt flying with a dragon. And then they escape flying on a dragon. Yeah. So that was kind of my like connections. No, yeah. those are really great threads. Thanks. Good job. Thank you. Micah, you had an idea that kind of blew my mind. Yeah. So keeping in mind that we now know that Rita is an animagus, there's this line for when Harry's in divination. It says, he managed to make a fly zoom straight into his hand, though he wasn't entirely sure that that was owing to his prowess at summoning charms. Perhaps the fly was just stupid. And <laughs> we all know Rita is a beetle, but it's probably very easy to misconstrue fly for beetle. And the way that J.K. Rowling chooses to write this moment just made me think that perhaps this was Rita you know, saying, oh, well, perhaps the fly was just stupid. Well, no, the fly's not stupid. The fly's going right into Harry's hand. You can make, you know, what you want of that. And a smart fly would do that in order to stay with Harry and and get a story out of it. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. 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 Max that. (laughs) Max Max. (laughs) that. I just wanted to say plus one to Trelawney for predicting that people in July were going to be in great danger of sudden violent deaths. She's not exactly wrong here. Harry was in great danger of sudden a sudden violent death. Now, this also was an easy prediction to make, especially if she knew what the first task would entail. But I like seeing her make these predictions that end up being accurate. And also just wanted to say... I found Pomfrey's reaction at the end of the first task interesting. Her quote is, Dragons, she said in a disgusted tone, pulling Harry inside. She seems to be almost shocked that the kids just had to face dragons. Did she not know about this in advance? Which I feel like would be a major issue when you are the school nurse. Like, you have to be ready for these kids when they are inevitably, probably attacked by dragons i agree with you this is absolutely crazy or she's still not over it after she found out weeks ago but boy does that seem like an oversight yeah i think it's more of her just commentary on the situation i would hope Mm -hmm. that she knew in advance but knowing how much the school is a security nightmare i wouldn't be surprised if she didn't but yeah she's very much like the rightly so but she's always the one that's complaining about how awful the school is and how yeah. much in danger the students always are. I can see Dumbledore coming to her like 30 minutes before like, hi, Poppy, you doing anything? Hey, uh, BT dubs. We're going to have uh, the kids face some dragons. You know, dragons. I don't know what they're getting into allegedly. <laughs> yeah. Just the way she exclaimed dragons made me feel like you only say it that way. If you just found out. <laughs> Yeah, I think. yeah, I like to think there's a whole bunch of healers straight from St. Mungo's because also a dragon burn is oh. surely worse than just like a stovetop burn. Like dragon fire, it has to be extra, extra bad. So, well, not unless it's from a Hungarian horntail, right, Eric? Right, that's the double. Other, yeah, that's from double the is other bad. dragons. Double it's bad. just like you know, a Hungarian horntail fire actually has spikes when it comes oh, out. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's time for MVP of the week. 
I'm going to flip things around for me this week. I'm awarding an un-MVP of the week, maybe a worst valuable player, Cedric, Ooh. for sacrificing Ooh. a rock-turned dog in the name of winning the task. Come on, man. I don't care if that dog was just a rock. That's not cool. I am a fellow dog lover, but the dragon didn't go for the dog in the end, so the dog rock is fine. <sighs> yeah, Risky. I mean, the dragon could probably sense that it wasn't a dog. He was oh. like, that's a rock. It fooled the dragon for a minute. <laughs> Maybe he should have tried that in the graveyard. Am I right, Andrew? <laughs> hey. Whoa. Whoa. Wow. Wow. Ouch. All right. I'll give him my MVP uh, to Cedric. Just kidding. Uh, to Hermione for <laughs> taking on the hopeless case of Harry Potter, uh, learning to do magic and helping him master summoning charms in just one day. It really can't have been easy. And he cannot possibly, as long as he lives, thank her enough for what she did. Yeah. And he doesn't. He does. So I do. Honestly. <laughs> Instead, yeah. So yeah. Eric does. Uh, yeah. I'm Shout out, it, Hermione. <laughs> give it to the Firebolt, uh, you know, traveling long distances across <laughs> Hogwarts grounds to come and save Harry's ass in the first task. I like that. Nobody showed up bigger. Maybe with the exception of Hermione. I do like that, Eric. Uh, yeah. But... I'm going to give it to the firebolt. Nobody showed up. <laughs> I'm going to give it to Fakie because ultimately he's the one who helped Harry figure out what he even needed to do. Yeah. So, you know, allegiances aside, he did help uh, cousin Harry out. And um, I'm going to give it to Professor McGonagall. Um, even though while she was having all the feels about Harry potentially being hurt, she was still trying to keep him calm and in the zone. Well, listeners, if you have any feedback about today's discussion, you can email or send a voice memo recorded on your phone to mugglecast at gmail.com, or you can use our phone number, which is 19203Muggle. That's 19203684453. We do have to say, though, we do prefer the voice memos. And if you could keep the message about a minute long, we would appreciate that so we can fit in as many voicemails as possible. And next week, we'll discuss chapter 21 of Gobble to Fire, the House Elf Liberation Front. And now it's time for our weekly trivia game, Quizage. Last week's Quizage question. What color are the Hungarian Horntail's eyes? The correct answer is that they're yellow. And I'm hearing Moaning Myrtle's voice. Those horrible yellow eyes. <laughs> but uh, congratulations to all the folks that got that uh, correct. And these are some of the best Quizich names of all time. Are you guys ready? <gasps> I'm so excited. Let's They're go. Amazing. Okay. Correct answers were submitted by a pretty pack of partly pink and purple polka dotted pygmy puffs playing piano. <laughs> all snapes and sizes. Buff Daddy. Oh, Clicking kudos for the girls' episodes, leaving a comment. Aww. Flambeed Harry on a golden egg sandwich a la mode. Everyone wants <laughs> second helpings. Hallow Wolf, Harry's greasiest problem, Hermione the mom friend. Hi to my Ravenclaw husband, Gen Pen 1013, Elsie, petitioned to stop using dragons for sporting purposes. Swagrids got drip. The egg <laughs> crushed by Fleur's dragon. The last Peruvian viper tooth in Tibet. The one 11 year old who is obsessed with muggle cast. Aw. We all love Newt. Y'all should salute. Put on your suits and kiss his boots. And finally, Fine. the <laughs> Swedish short snout that would like to tell Cedric, good job. Oh, wait, he's dead. Oh, <laughs> ouch. There's a lot of Cedric hate on this show, I think. I uh, hope it's been enough time. We had two weeks off of chapter by chapter. And let's be honest, that was just to give Kiera enough time to read ahead, right? So we, not, we didn't just spoil yes, her right now. True. Okay, great. Thank you for the fun names. Here is next week's quiz question. It's another color question or similar. Ooh. What is the pattern of Dobby's tie when Harry first encounters him in the Hogwarts kitchens? What pattern is Dobby's tie? Dobby's back. Dobby's back. It's a spoiler, isn't it? It's kind of a, well, foreshadow. I mean, okay, it's, we, we, we're going to see Dobby. I'm excited to see Dobby. Business Dobby. He's got Business a tie. Dobby. Business Dobby. <laughs> Dobby wears a tie to work. Business in the front, pillow in the back. 
submit your Quizich answers to us on the MuggleCast website, MuggleCast.com slash Quizich, or click on Quizich from the main nav bar. Thanks so much for joining us today, Catherine. Absolutely. It was an absolute pleasure. I've had so much fun. Like I said, I've been an OG fan since, you know, 2005. So this is an absolute like dream to Aww. like meet you all and to hang out for the couple hours we hung out. So I appreciate it. Have me back on. Yeah. I'd love it. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to have you back on. You were you contributed so much today and and thanks for your support over the years. This show is brought to you listeners by muggles like Catherine and you all. We don't have any fancy corporate or network funding. We're just Harry Potter fans trying to be your Harry Potter friends. And we're very proudly an independent podcast. So you can support us by going to patreon.com slash MuggleCast. And you can have the chance to uh, be a co-host on MuggleCast one day like Catherine was today. You get access to uh, our live streams, our planning docs, a new physical gift every year. And then the MuggleCast Collectors Club, too. And then if you'd prefer to support us through Apple Podcasts, you can do that. You can get ad-free, early access to MuggleCast, plus two bonus MuggleCast installments every month, as do patrons. All you have to do is sign up for MuggleCast Gold. Just tap into the show on Apple Podcasts, and you'll see the subscribe button. And whether you whether you subscribe through Patreon or Apple Podcasts, we do have a free trial as well as an annual subscription and if you do the annual subscription you will save a little money and that's our way of thanking you for pledging for a year up front visit mugglecast.com for transcripts social media links our full episode archive our favorite episodes and a lot more about the show and if you enjoy the show and think other muggles would too tell a friend about the show and we'd also appreciate if you left us a review in your favorite podcast app All right, that does it for this week's episode. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. I'm Laura. And I'm Catherine. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye. y'all.